Welcome to 80s TV Ladies, part of the Weirding Way Media Network. friends. Welcome to 80s TV Ladies, where we explore female-driven television shows from the 1980s and celebrate the people who made them. With your fabulous hosts, Sharon Johnson and Susan Lambert Haddam. Hello, I'm Sharon. And I'm Susan. And we're fabulous, apparently. Thank you, Melissa. We are super thrilled for today's guest, an impressive and versatile Emmy-nominated and Emmy-winning director and a fabulous 80s television lady who has first-hand insights into what has changed in her 35 years of working in Hollywood. Mary Lou Belli has won two Los Angeles area Emmy Awards and is a two-time primetime Emmy nominee for The Ms. Pat Show. Mary Lou is a television director who has worked on such shows as Charles in Charge, NCIS New Orleans, Station 19, Devious Maids, The Hughleys, Wizards of Waverly Place, and so many more. In addition to directing over 150 episodes of TV, Miss Belli is a director of award-winning short films as well. And she's an acting coach and the co-author of four books, the new sitcom career book, Acting for Young Actors, Directors Tell the Story, and acting for the screen. As an incredible leader in the industry, she serves on several councils, boards, and DGA committees, is an honorary board member of the Alliance of Women Directors, and advisory board member of Women in Media. Please welcome to 80s TV ladies, Miss Mary Lou Belli. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. We are so happy to have you here, and I want to hear all about your journey. Okay, happy to share that with you. (laughs) It was a nice journey. You um, went to Penn State. And did you study acting or and or directing there? Yeah. Uh, well, I had one directing class. I was terrible. I mean, I was terrible because so much of directing is having a point of view in the stories you tell, because that's basically what we are. Now, what I was really good at from an early age, and it was because I was a lifelong reader. I mean, I was that kid who went to the library and came home with a stack of books every Saturday. And any genre, you know, it was science fiction for 10 years, and then it was, you know, something else. But my field of study was acting. And I graduated from Penn State in three years with 30 extra credits uh, because I still looked like, no kidding, 14 years old. And I uh, scooted my butt to New York City, where I'd grown up 14 miles outside the city. Um, so I got there as quickly as I could to try to get those parts where I was playing kids. And I did. Uh, while I was in my early 20s, like early, early 20s. So, um, and I worked pretty steadily. I had my equity card for the theater a month after I arrived in New wow. York, which was, I mean, people go years without that. Um, and then I was doing, you know, you know, under fives on soap operas and, uh, you know, auditioning for commercials and stuff like that. But it was only about two years into that journey. I met my husband at a commercial audition. He skated me home. Because we were both on roller skates. I'm sorry. Hold on. <laughs> the rest is in the book. <laughs> um, but he was from Los Angeles or he was from Southern California. He actually was from the East Coast, but had grown up a, a bit of his life. And he still had a car in his parents' garage. And I went, I really want to look at this TV thing. Um, so we came out for a visit like a month after we got married. And we were living in Los Angeles a year later. Wow. And the rest is history. He keeps entertaining ideas. We've looked at real estate in the Berkshires and New York City. And and one about two years ago, he came down for breakfast and he said, you're never leaving this house, are you? I went, <laughs> I love California. I love, we've just taken two major road trips, desert, mountain, seashore trip. We did um, Joshua Tree, then uh, had dinner in Palm Springs with friends, went to the mountains in the Cleveland National Forest, and then we ended up in Del Mar. And we just finished Sonoma, where we stayed 20 minutes from Red a Redwood Preserve and 20 minutes from uh, the coast, you know, where they filmed Hitchcock's um, The Birds. The birds. Yeah. And then stopped at our favorite beach in Montecito, you know, 
I had made egg salad this morning. We ate our egg salad on the beach. <laughs> so you're That's a awesome. California girl. <laughs> no, not born and bred, but kind of in the blood. Of course, you know, this is so funny. I have two children. My bridesmaid had two children about the same time. She stayed in New York City because that's where I got married. Um, Both kids came out to California for school. My kids, born in Los Angeles, went to New York City. (laughs) And they're still there, both my kids. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Yeah. So, so, you know, it was, but the acting, singing, dancing, informed, and, and a well, really good theater degree in which I was made to take things like lighting and set design and, you know, and also because it was a, a state university, I had to take things like symbolic logic and, and I had a great Shakespeare teacher and I, and at Penn state, all the, all the theater and film and television disciplines were very split up. So I studied dance in the phys ed department, sometimes with like some of the football players in my ballet class. I studied music in the music department separate. I got my degree in the theater department. Um, and But the big communication school now, which I mentor for, is the Belisario School, which is a completely different college than arts and architecture where I studied. So, yeah. I want to go back to the 80s. Okay, great. Let's please too. One of your first jobs Good memories. was on a 1984 sitcom called Domestic. Oh, domestic Life. Yes. yes. Oh, and you're going to talk about one of my favorite actresses of all time. Yes. Judith Marie Bergen played Martin Mull's wife on that. After many, 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 many decades of working in the television industry, she left and became one of the leading ladies at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, where I saw her do countless roles. She remained a lifelong friend. We lost her a few years ago. Oh, Um, And it was it was a great job. And. The little girl who I worked with on that show, um, Megan Follows, who at that time, I can't remember if she had already been Anne of Green Gables. It doesn't look like she had. I don't think she had. She was about she was to. 16. Guys, I taught her to drive on the back lot of the Universal Studios <laughs> in, my, in my crappy car. I think it was like a used Volkswagen that we had bought so that, she, the, you know, because it was like on the back lot, we could do things like that. You taught Anne Shirley how to drive? (laughs) Yes, I taught Anne Shirley how to drive. (laughs) And I don't know if you know this, and maybe she should be a person on your your show. She has now become a director. When she was doing the CW show Rain, R-E-I-G-N, she ended up directing the show. Now, mind you, she comes from a long line of, I mean, her dad was a very famous Canadian director. Um, her mom, uh, a leading actress at the uh, uh, Stratford Shakespeare Festival. Her sister, her older sister, I think, was a director as well. But now she's the hyphenate, too. <laughs> that is amazing. That I didn't know that she had become a director. And I would love to have, we'd love to have her on the show. I mean, well, uh, just yeah. remind me and I'll I introduce will. you. I'll make an in- intro. That'd be great. That's sure. wonderful. Yeah. Okay. I do want to say it starred Martin Mull, but Steve Martin co created the show. Martin was our executive producer. Martin and Steve are close, 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 close friends to this day. Mm. Um, And mainly because not of their TV interest, although, you know, Steve was a megastar from Saturday Night Live. But Martin Mull is one of the finest uh, painters of our time. I don't know if you know this. He's represented by one of the by the Freeman Gallery. He's an extraordinary artist, RISD trained in huge museum collections. and Steve has one of the foremost art collections in the world. I did know that part, but I did not know the Martin Mull part. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so here's my great story about that. They would sit in the audience. Steve would be in the front row. And um, and Steve wasn't there all the time. But I remember one day when Steve and Martin was doing a entrance down the stairs and coming and yelling back upstairs to his wife. Or maybe Judith Marie Bergen was already in the kitchen. He was yelling as she, he was entering the room or yelling back to her because she was upstairs. Of course, there was no upstairs because it was a TV stairs into the living room. And Martin ad-libbed or Steve and Martin, Steve and Martin would decide what the ad-lib was going to be. He'd try it. Everybody would laugh. And then he they put their heads together and he'd go, no, 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 I go try another. Mind you, this was a non sequitur. It had nothing to do with the scene, but it was about can we get a laugh? On Martin's entrance. Every single one, like I was peeing in my pants. Every single one was funny. And the two of them sat down 
in a very intellectual way and discussed, which was the funny est. And that was my introduction to sitcoms. And I went, oh. Like an education oh, right there. Oh, my goodness. It, it was an education. And it was about perfection and refinement and improvement. And that show was all about that. Also, there was a wonderful other actress. You know, domestic life was about the domestic life of a person who was a talk show host. Or, um and there was a wonderful actress. She introduced me to still one of my favorite Chinese restaurants in Chinatown, Los Angeles to this day. Her name was Mia or is Mia Hunt. And she was wonderful on the show. Yeah. In a show that was at a lot of men. Yeah. But it was Mia and Judith Marie Bergen and, and Megan Follows. That is amazing. What were you doing on the show? I was called the understudy, like in theater. There was a director, um, Will McKenzie, who had come from the theater. He'd also been on New Heart. I mean, he was an actor and a huge voiceover artist as well uh, at that time. And he said, if these two children on the show are going to be in school four, five, six hours a day, you need to get me two adult actors to play them so that I can rehearse my whole time. And I was that person for Megan was the onset of that time of women playing professionals or women being strong like a Shelley Long or a Rhea Perlman or a Kirstie Alley from Cheers or Felicia Rashad you know you know there was it was a time of empowerment in terms of women being smart and a leader in the family you know Murphy Brown I mean you know you look at Candace Bergen and that and then you know all the quirkiness of the Golden Girls you know yeah. although I knew Estelle's work <gasps> oh from? From the theater. She had starred in the original production of Torch Song Trilogy with Harvey Firestein. She played his mom in the third act of that, which was the third play called Women and Children First, I think. Mm. I think that was the name of the third act. And it was, she was brilliant. It was really about Harvey's relationship with the mother figure. And I mean, she was probably... 50 or 60 playing older mm -hmm. at that time. It was before Golden Girls and it brought her to light and everybody in the New York theater scene went, who is that actress in this sensationally good play? So how did you go from that to directing in TV? I, you know, it's so interesting because on Domestic Life, Jack Riley, who had also been on New Heart before that, he had played the uh, very famous role of Mr. Carlin, pulled me aside one day and he goes, you're a director. And I said, no, no, I took one class at Penn State. I was terrible. I was a good stage manager, but I, again, didn't have that point of view yet. And he said, no, you're a director. And it sort of lit a fire in my belly. And I went back to the a theater company that I belonged to as an actress, um, Theater West. Here in Los Angeles, right on Coenga. Yeah, it was founded by Betty Garrett, who became a lifelong friend. And Andy Parks, her son, and Garrett Parks, and Karen, the daughter-in-law, I mean. And I, um, I directed my first play there. With a woman who I'd known from my theater work in New York City, a woman named Dinah Lenny, who's still a close friend. We wrote my second book with her. She's she's written many, many other books solo uh, since then. Um, a memoir specialist. And <laughs> she's doing another play in Los Angeles now that I can't wait to see. So, you know, full circle. Um, but Jack took me aside, Jack Riley, and said, you're a director. I said, you're wrong. And then I went to the theater and I went, and it was a very safe, protective environment. It's the same theater where Chaz Pamentary developed a Bronx tale, you know, piece by piece. We saw a lot of it at that theater before <laughs> it became a Bronx tale. Fast forward, my son is in college in the BFA program at Pace University. And his favorite teacher freshman year, when he was on the dean's list, was the author of the first play I directed called Today's Special. The author's name was Judd Lear Silverman. Judith Marie Bergen from Domestic Life starred wow. in, uh, I did, I, I directed the play twice. Dinah Lenny starred in it once and Judith Marie Bergen the second time. And uh, directing got the bite of me and I went, oh yeah. And also I was much more mature. Between the time I graduated from college and the time I got to Los Angeles, my New York roommate's mother, passed away from blood cancer. It was not. Mm. And I was there to support her through that. And, um, you know, when life kind of kicks you in the butt, 
you grow up a little bit faster. And that was one of the big life events, among others, that happened to me during that time. And by that time, I went, oh, yeah, I do have a point of view. <laughs> you formulate <laughs> yeah. a point of view. Yeah. And, and, and I became very opinionated. <laughs> well, that works for a director. It does. It does. It worked very well. And um, so Theater West was my home. And at that theater, I produced and or directed over 75 plays. Wow. Now, most of them were one acts because Theater West was known for, you know, really stimulating new talent. You know, some very, very famous people had plays done there. Peter Noah, I think, I think being a current exec producer. And then the other company I belonged to was Company of Angels, where I directed quite a bit. And one of the first plays I did there, um, Will Calhoun, you know, a, a mm. play I directed that ended up being, Will was on Friends later and many other shows. But um, I ended up selling that play as a movie to TriStar. So it was, yeah. Wow. Tom Hanks, for a minute, was interested in possibly playing the role. It's a wonderful, wonderful play that has yet to be made into a movie and should be. As you were beginning to go down that road and think I should look into directing television. What were the things about it over, say, acting in television that you said, okay, this is what I want to do? Oh, Sharon, what a great question. Um, I didn't like acting that much. Mm. I mean, I love acting. I love actors. I love the process of acting. But having been in the theater, I remember reaching the 100th performance of the show I was doing. And I went, oh my God, I'm going to kill myself. I'm so bored. Mm. So for me, the thing I loved about the theater was the puzzle. And in TV, it was a new puzzle every week. And I loved that about it. I love the change. You know, even my agents, you know, who have brought me things like, do you want to try a feature? And I go, you know, it'd have to be a really, really strong script for me to even consider at this point. And I've turned down more than I can tell you films because I go, no, I could probably do like five, six episodes in that same amount of time. <laughs> and if I'm developing it, it's two years. It's, you know, mm -hmm. now uh, movies made for television are different because they're just like directing, you know, what we do all the time, which is a block of two episodes because it's the same length. So that's different. But I love the pace. I love the pace and the challenge of the new puzzle. And it's also why I really love going from show to show to show. You know, I'm I'm an exec producer on the Miss Pat show now. Mm -hmm. so I'm there for the entire season. But sitcoms don't take as long as a season of episodic, which is kind of like a nine month commitment. Sitcoms, it depends if you're not taking hiatuses, can go as quickly as, you know, 10 episodes in 10 weeks. So I like the fastness of that. And then having taken so long in my career to break out of comedy and get a huge amount of respect as a big action director and drama, which I, I love, 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 love that genre. It's nice to be able to now uh, go back and be able to do both, which I specifically did not try to direct any sitcoms or really was very, very, nope, keep me in this, keep me in this lane for a while until I make a name for myself. And then, you know, when I saw Debbie Allen's pilot of the Miss Pat show, I went, oh yeah, this is the one. This is the one. As many as they want. I'm there. So you came back to comedy for the Miss Pat show. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was going to say, not many directors go back and forth between right. comedy and no, drama. No, it's hard. You know why? It's so sad. Because people pigeonhole you. I mean, I got pigeonholed when I was doing children's programming, when I was doing all the Peter Engel shows, the guy who created Saved by the Bell, who is still a lifelong friend. And, you know, I'm so grateful for he and the two women who work for him, Linda Mancuso, who's no longer with us, and Carrie. Um, I'm so grateful that I got support from them. There was one other, who am I thinking of? Um, Robin Schwartz, who said, yeah, give Mary Lou the chance. And it was because I'd come up as being a coach mm. for Saved by the Bell, the new class. And they said, oh, she directs, she wants to direct, let's give her the shot. Um, I think I had already directed Charles in Charge and maybe Major Dad. So I was the series director. So I would do 22 episodes or 20 episodes or... For Saved by the Bell. For the other shows I did. Um, mm -hmm. I did a show called USA High. And then I did one called One World. 
And those were my like four years for Peter Engel. And it was a great, great time. And I learned so much. Well, and it gave you a lot of, you banked a lot. I banked a lot. You banked a lot. Yeah. And and it's not, you know, and it's not just the directing actors, which really came easily to me. It was a chance to do other things with cameras. And then on top of that, editing. Editing's a huge part of the job. It also was a place where there were women working, which was kind of nice. And still, uh, it's also a big place women move up from. And so that's what I was going to say. So this is the 90s, right, that, that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds like you were on that show with a lot of other women creators and women behind the scenes. A lot of women, a lot of women executives, especially. And then, you know, uh, script supervisors who are the unsung heroes of our business. Smartest, hardest job, good at it, not nearly compensated for the expertise they bring. But, you know, there were some really formidable directors who kind of mentored me or who I got to watch. I watched Debbie Allen. Nancy Ballone was my mentor for my my first documentary, for which I won my first L.A. local Emmy. Lee Shallot Schemmel. I can't remember if she was just Lee Shallot then, but I knew her from her theater work and I was so grateful. I think I watched her on the Ellen DeGeneres show. Linda Day was a huge person. And Joan Darling, who I went later on to direct in a play. That's amazing. And so you would shadow them or how would they help mentor you? I shadowed Lee. Um, Joni, I knew because so many people I knew studied acting with her. Linda Day was just like the person I wanted to be. (laughs) And Nancy Malone, I knew through the guild. So your first show was Charles in Charge that you got to direct. That was the first episode of television. I was there for the first season when it was a CBS show before it went, they just bought then a hundred episodes, I think, or a hundred, close to a hundred for syndication. So it was Julie Cobb the first year who played the mom. And then in the second reincarnation, it was Sandra Kearns and Ellen Travolta they brought on. Again, three amazingly strong mom figures, you know, although it was always interesting because they had the most interaction as an adult with Charles played by Scott Bayo, But, you know, there were, you know, very smart young women, sassy, who were on that show. And then on Major Dad, the second show I went on to direct, it was Shanna Reed. And again, the mother of three smart, amazing women. So it's, you know, and at the same time, you know, Judith Light was doing Who's the Boss? And there was a lot happening in 80s television, which is why we do the podcast. <laughs> but yeah. And then I got to follow on the New Heart show. And then Julia Duffy you know, became a friend. I love Julia Duffy. Yeah. Who was, if you remember, one of the other designing women. Oh, yes. Yes. Smart. And and also a theater person. Goes back and forth to the theater. I, you know, I've seen her at Pasadena Playhouse. I've seen her at the Laguna Playhouse. I've seen her do gobs and gobs of work. But also, you know, all of those women were formidable. Dixie Carter and mm. Delta Park and the brilliant Jean Smart. Love her. You know, Annie's has never stopped working, mm-hmm. you know, and always done amazing, you know, from films to television. But the breadth of roles that Gene Smart has played since then. Oh, my God. I mean, and also my favorite, one of my favorite sitcoms of all time. I think they didn't do more than six, maybe 10 episodes. Style and Substance. Yes. Brilliant show. I remember that. Yeah. And I think Peter, Peter, what was his last name? Peter created it. He went on, it was an Emmy Award winning writer, but it was a great, she played a Martha Stewart like character on that. Although that might've been, you know, nineties. Yeah. But, you know, 24 and and now hacks. So amazing. Nancy McKeon. Mm -hmm. I was like, there was somebody to like balance, like there was somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Nancy McKeon, who had already done, I think. Facts of Life right. with Mindy Kim. Yeah. Peter Tolan yeah. was the creator on Peter that show. Peter Tolan. Yeah. 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 You know, there, there are a lot of shows that, that didn't last nearly as long as they quote unquote should have. Yeah. Um, Domestic Life. Mm-hmm. TV guy called the best new sitcom of the season. They aired the first six or seven episodes in four different time slots. Oh, gosh. Who thought that was a good idea? <laughs> And then went, oh, gosh, this is not working. Well, 
you know, give it a chance. Come on. I don't know how you don't give the Steve Martin, Martin (laughs) Mull created show. I mean, he had already done The Jerk and he was already Steve Martin. That's what I really almost don't understand. Hey, guys, I did pilots. I did a pilot with Sarah Jessica Parker that I thought and Alan King playing the father of three young women, I thought was the funniest pilot I had ever worked on. Never saw the light of day. Sadly, a lot of times a decision whether or not to pick up a pilot is not necessarily about whether or not the pilot is good. There are a lot of other factors. I'm going to tell you a story and I'm going to name who it was because I don't think this is telling stories out of school. I was in Steve McPherson's office on the Disney lot. I was interviewing him for one of my books and he came in and it was, I think, one or two weeks before Upfronts. And this is for people who don't know what Upfronts is when they decide what the next season is going to be on television. So from all the pilots they make, they're choosing what the lineup is and very often tossing out hundreds of good shows. And I remember him coming in and and something was, you know, I didn't know him that well, but he was not happy. I mean, I mean he wasn't crabby or anything. He just, he seemed sad. And I said, everything okay? He goes, I just had to tell the people who wrote the best pilot of the season that they weren't getting on the schedule. First of all, the empathy I had for the person in that job, because it was about programming. Mm -hmm. What goes with what? What audience is going to stick with one show to the next? And, you know, gobs of other reasons, you know, they're, you know, sometimes shows don't go because people are. (laughs) And, you know, life is too short to work with. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) <laughs> totally agree. Okay. If you can talk about getting that first yeah. episode of Charles in Charge. Yeah, it was the director of the show when it came back in its second incarnation was a man named Phil Ramuno. He was doing, I think, all the episodes. I stayed with Phil every night that he did shots because they trusted me with the acting. They did. You know, that was, you know, I was coaching the kids um, on the show and, you know, They knew I understood that part of the storytelling. And um, Phil was generous enough. Um, And this was before we wrote a book together, a Sikon career book, that I just started marking my script the way he did until I understood it. And then I started marking the script by myself and then comparing it to what he did. And it was in the booth of that show that Phil's agent sat next to me. I didn't know who it was. He said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I just do this. You know, I mark all the shots so I can compare it. He says, why? I said, practice. That man went on to be my agent for 19 years through three different agencies. Wow. Yeah, it was great to do that show. And so did you say, I want to direct? Oh, yeah, I I definitely said, I want to direct. They they knew it and I made it clear. But more than that, and I remember... Um, Al Burton, who was exec producer, who was very generous. During that time I was there, he gave four women their first episode. Awesome. Four. That's huge for 80s television. Unheard of. Let wow. one, let alone four. But he was he had come from the Norman Lear school of good and generous and, you know, supportive. And uh, you know, they they said, give Mary Lou a shot. And they thought I was doing my homework. Oh, and the other thing I did simultaneously, because I started directing theater, was, this was before the internet, where you could say, oh, here's my good review. I would hand out, I would Xerox every good review I got. The masthead would take up half the sheet, and then the review would be next to it. And the review would have a highlight of sometimes the nine words that were about me. And... I was totally okay with people going, oh, thank you, how great, and tossing it, just fine. But there was a, it was sort of my way of saying, people are noticing. And I teach this still to directors who are trying to make a name for themselves, is having an authority figure other than yourself or people who are making money off of you, like your agents or managers, having an authority figure like a newspaper say, oh, she's good, or an exec producer from a show you've worked on, oh, she's good made all the difference in the world. And for me, it was every play I had. Oh, Mary Lou, you did this? Yeah. Or, oh, you produce this? Oh, or you direct this? And, you know, I was running, you know, getting nominated for Drama Log Awards and, you know, LA Drama Critics Awards and stuff like that. So I was making my name in the theater. And every time I did, um, you did a little 
paper email. Paper <laughs> newsletter. <laughs> yeah. Look what happened. <laughs> okay, we're going to take a little break. Great. Be right back. Welcome back. Good, thank you. So excited to continue this conversation and to give you congratulations for your Emmy nomination for the Miss Pat show thank you. for 2023. My second prime time, I have one in children's programming. I have two LA local okay. Emmys already that I and won. And the local Emmys were for a documentary. A social justice things I did for cable TV. Mm. And one of the directors who had mentored me, Nancy Malone, had been the exec producer of one of them, the first one. And then when Nancy passed, I went on to become the exec producer for sponsoring, I think, six more women. It was an all women project. It was just just amazing. That is amazing. And so we'll jump back to your shows and the people you worked with. But I do want to talk about your sort of work with women in film and media and in teaching and coaching and bringing up the next generation and a diverse and inclusive generation and what that means to you. What's important to me now is to make sure that we shine a light on the talent that is there and ready and trained. And I know because I've trained a lot of them and I know they're ready if they could just get a shot um, and some have and exploded in their own careers. One of them, Keisha Sharp who was one of the girls on Girlfriends, is now like a fabulous director. And Tracy Ellis Ross is directing. And, you know, and so many, Mara Brock Akeel, who created Girlfriends, is directing. And there's so many people who have just, you know, said, okay, I'm a storyteller. This is what I do. Um, I want to direct as well. So that's what I do now. Um, I have been teaching a lot of the diversity programs for NBC, CBS, places where I sit on the board like Women in Media, Film Fatale, Alliance of Women Directors, the Directors Guild, which is my guild where I teach a lot and mentor um, and teach the first time directors class. (laughs) Um, AFI, um, you know, I've done lectures for women in film, which was the first organization um, and trailblazers for all those women organizations long before any of the others existed. But I'm in that position now. And a lot of it comes from not just being a director who has experience, but a lot of it also has come my way because of the books I've written. It's my pleasure and privilege to um, teach. I do most of it with the co-author of the directing book, uh, Bethany Rooney. Um, Our book is Directors Tell the Story in its second edition, hopefully about to go into its third. Yeah. and, And not just teaching craft, but also teaching. I mean, one of the last seminars that I loved Bethany Rooney joined me on this when we went into breakout rooms, was taking a meeting. You know, how do you craft that elevator pitch? What are people looking for in that interview? You know, it's not just being able to say, I know the craft, I can do it, but giving the confidence because directing in particular is a personality driven job. You have to be the person that an entire crew is willing to follow and listen to and respect. And jump on board in terms of your vision. Anybody who tells you it's not a personality-driven job is wrong. I remember being invited to a dinner, and I won't say specifics because I mean you could someone might be watching. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, but there was a director who said to me, um, "I have this film. I've done all the shot lists for the entire movie because I don't want anyone asking me any questions." And I went, "Oh, wrong business." You're not a director. Yeah. All of what it does all day long is answer questions. And if you think, if you want someone to leave you alone so you can be this auteur, you're not going to last. That sounds like somebody wants to write as opposed to direct because you can sit and write on your own and do it any way you want. But when you're trying to do something where all these, all these other people are expected to execute your vision, they have to talk to you. Otherwise, how will they know yes. what you want? Yes, but and even more than that, Sharon, it's such a a wonderful best idea wins kind of job that um, if I've created an environment where anybody from craft service on to my up to my DP or, you know, the creator of the show gives me a good idea and I run with it, you know, that's my job. And it's my taste of saying, oh, good idea. (laughs) I'm stealing it or Great idea. I'm smart enough to recognize it. And 
especially, and this is something that Bethany and I teach is so important, is recognizing the contribution of the actor. So you come in with all your homework done in terms of prep, which is really where directors do most of their work. But to be open, once you say action to a better idea that comes from an actor and you go, oh, yeah, and I can amend my plan to do this, this and this. But, oh, wow, that was 10 times better than anything I thought of. Yeah. And I'm smart enough to see it. There are a lot of smart people around you, hopefully, that can maybe come up with that better idea. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And to be able to adapt around it if you've done your homework. If, if you've done your homework, Susan, it is, I, I feel, the key to being able to adapt and pivot because you still have to get the work done on time and on budget. And the prepping, you were doing that specifically to say, this is the way it will work. Well, I like to tell directors now, this is a way it will work. Mm. And now you know the ingredients, but the ingredients, you know, you might shake them up differently. And there might be a new ingredient. <laughs> You're so funny. You're so excited. Like, when do you sleep? Do you sleep? (laughs) I've had trouble sleeping since I was a teenager. And every once in a while, I'll wake up in the morning. I'll say to my husband, oh, my gosh, I slept through the night, which is unusual. But I'm a person who gets up in the middle of the night when I can't sleep and I read. I'm a huge reader. So I always have a couple of books going. I'm reading this book. But it feels like a monograph that one of the exec producers from Monk Hmm. had sent because what we share is our favorite director is Sidney Pollack. So this is a fabulous, fabulous book. On Sidney Pollack. About Sidney Pollack. A little dry, but the information is great. And so I rewatched Havana last night and I was in the middle of the chapter about Havana. And I'm waiting for a DVD of Bobby Deerfield to show up that works. I had one last week. It didn't work that I'm going to watch next. And I think every other film that's talked about in the book I've seen, because I didn't even realize I'd never seen Bobby Deerfield. How did that happen? It's the Pacino movie. And I, did I miss it? And so what's the name of the book? uh, Sidney Pollack, existential director. Existential is in the title. I'll find it. And it's great. It's, it's very, very interesting, especially if you're huge Sidney Pollack. So I'm doing my first job or my second job. I'm on the Universal lot. I'm headed to my parking spot. And Sidney Pollack, Mirage Productions had their office not far from the soundstage I was working. And Sidney's walking. I know he was walking to the commissary, whatever. I almost hit him. I was so excited to see him. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. It's Sidney Pollack. (laughs) What is it about him as a director that you think um, appeals to you so? Sharon, I think. First of all, that he came up very similar to me, that he was a dialogue coach first. Mm. So he was an acting coach. He also was trained Meisner, and I had a lot of Meisner training. Um, So I think we think alike, but also his subject matters. And it's so interesting. When Bethany and I teach, if it's from casting, we always want to add, it's this, this, and this, which is the obvious, and then throw in something else. Um, Throw in an opposite. If you're suggesting casting, give me two adjectives that describe the character and then give me a third one that's contrasting so that character immediately becomes three dimensional. And there's a dimensionality to all of Pollock's work. You know, his romances are romantic, but, you know, they don't always have happy endings, you know, or they're complex. And I also loved how many genres. I mean, If you think of Jeremiah Johnson to uh, Tootsie to Out of Africa to The Firm, and you go, those are all Sidney Pollack films? You know, I, I mean, if you, you go to some other director and you just go, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, that feels like a so-and-so film. Um, you know, like a Chris Nolan film. I go, oh, yeah, yeah. Although Oppenheim, I'm really looking. Oh, Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to that because I think that might be a little bit of a departure. So, um, but you know, there's, there's, you know, a Chris Nolan film. Yeah. 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 Although I, I hate being boxed in, but I think the box that Sidney created for himself. And then of course his last film before he died was a documentary about Frank Gehry, you know, and you just go, Oh, he liked architecture too. And he, you know, so it's like so smart and he loved actors. 
loved actors and always appreciated their contribution. And I think we have that in common. Yeah. I love The Electric Horseman. Can I talk about one other podcast on your podcast? Yes, yes. please. Julia Louis Dreyfus's um, Wiser Than Me. The interview with Jane Fonda is priceless. And I just said to my husband, who listened to that podcast with me, I said, he hadn't seen, I think, Fonda in five acts mm. or four acts, whatever it is. Um, I said, oh, I'll watch that again because she just she just inspires me as an activist and a feminist. And she's just a remarkable human being. For sure. I saw her on the line with Lily Tomlin outside of Netflix for the strike. So that was fun. Um, all right. So let's travel back to uh, 70s and 80s for a second and just as a woman in that space, trying to walk onto a set and have a crew of mostly men uh -huh. listen to you. What did you do for that? Uh, you know what? There were tricks. Okay. With the generation above me, and I still use this, with people who are used to and demand respect first and foremost before they'll even listen to you, you pose something as a question. Do you think... You know, right. To most people, I'll say, I'd like you to try. But posing things as a question to that generation, um, especially of men who thought they knew better than. <laughs> um, it was just a respectful way of doing it. And I have to say, and not a bad thing, because anyone who's worked that hard and long. I had an older actress on a TV series I directed last year, the year before, who they were having a lot of challenges with the amount of time being demanded by this person while shooting. It was effing things up. It was not good. I approached the director producer and said, I think I'd like to try this. <laughs> he was sort of pulling his hair out. He goes, go ahead, see if it'll work. I did, and it did work. You know, sometimes attention just must be paid especially if someone has accumulated enough credits and they want to be heard and they want to be considered and they want the work they're putting in listened to and, and part of the package. And you just have to do it. I just made sure I did it on the weekend with a writer present so that by the time we got to set, she knew what I was going to do. So it was no problem. And respect was owed. You know, you mm -hmm. that hard and long. You know, I mean, there's there's stories of people who, you know, a friend of mine, uh, the man who created Major Dad, I hope I'm not telling a story out of school, um, went into CBS to sell a Carol Burnett special before the last one that just happened. And one of the executives, um, he said, I have, you know, there's all these outtakes from the original Carol Burnett show. I think it would make it. It did. It like mega, mega hit in terms of viewers that watched this because it sold in the room. And one of the executives, they said, well, do you know who this is? I mean, they're at the CBS studios. The joke was CBS stood for Carol Burnett studio. And she said, oh yeah, she played Miss Hannigan. <laughs> well, sure. I mean, you know, you take what you know. <laughs> oh goodness. Or I think there's, I, I, I can't remember the story, but I think there's also a Shelley Winter story about, I mean, I think she'd won an Oscar and then went in, yeah, you know, and like I don't know it all. I don't the way know. I'm not, I don't Do you know, know it Sharon? well enough to tell. Uh, just the bones of it. Basically, she went into a meeting with a producer or director who was considering her for a role on a film, and there was some concern, I guess, that was conveyed to her before the meeting about whether or not, for lack of a better phrase, she, she could handle the part. So she walked in, sat down, pulled one of her Oscars out, pulled the other one out and you know, she got the part. So. All right. I have it right here. <laughs> she sat down in a casting director's office and, uh, after, you know, hellos, the man said, now Miss Winters, remind me what you've done. Oh dear. <laughs> and then she reached her bag and pulled out the Academy Awards. I mean, <laughs> how do you, yeah, just, how do you take that meeting? Well, I mean, I don't know, but uh, you yeah. how do you not, <laughs> Do your Take research. a moment. Do your have homework. your assistant do the research. Some, if you're not going to do it yourself, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, all right. But what do you think has changed? You started in the '80s. The industry has changed dramatically. But for you, for women behind the scenes, 
and in front of the scenes. Well, I'll, I will tell you, identifying us as minorities, women, because the number of jobs that went to women were so small, was the best thing that ever happened to us. Because in our case, affirmative action, which I truly believe in, in every sense of the word, even though the Supreme Court might not, don't get me started. We'll do that in another podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. Open the playing field so much so that people who were skilled and would benefit from experience got a shot at it. So that exists. And we have data to prove how many people have now had a chance and succeeded and gotten asked back and have, you know, careers. So that's changed drastically. And here's another thing that changed. This is not a good thing. I mean, it's good that it's changed, but it wasn't a good thing at the time. When I was coming up, the competition amongst women was so fierce and the opportunities were so small. Sharon, I can see your face, so I know you're smiling. Um, That there was only place for one person in the room. And I've witnessed this not just in my field, but with politicians who have been the only women in the room and know what it's like. And therefore, the competitiveness amongst women is once you got on top or got into the club, not everyone was as generous as they could have been. And I understand it. They fought hard. They got it. That's not the case anymore. I find the wave of generosity. Now, that might be as a result that there's way more jobs out there. We're not talking about ABC, CBS, and NBC. You know, we had Fox and then we had cable and now we have streaming. So there's a lot more opportunities. So maybe I'm in the position to be more generous or people who weren't generous might have been under those circumstances. But that is something that has changed for the better that I would say, for an example, I'm having a tea tomorrow for women directors and a couple assistant directors who one of whom has only directed one episode, but that's what she wants to do. And I said, and a mentee you want to bring. There's no hesitancy of, I'd like to be in that club and I'd like to bring someone along. And that spirit of generosity, I'm going to, I'm going to cry. The spirit of generosity that is the wave of change is so amazing. And it makes me really proud to be of this time. And also, I'm not going to leave the men out of it. The generosity from men to help women, the, you know, we for she or, or or just the men who let me observe, you know, and said, yeah, Mary Lou deserves a place at the table or Bethany Rooney, who let me observe her and then, you know, wrote a book with me. And, you know, there's, there's people whose careers were far more advanced than mine were that said, sure, come on. And not only come on, watch me and a, a shadow me, but if you have any questions, I'll answer them. And, oh, I'm having lunch and the exec producer is over at that table. Let's go eat with that exec producer so they can see who you are. You know, there's there are a lot of good people out there and their generosity touches me. And now it's those of us in a position to bring forward that next generation. It's not just our privilege, it's our obligation. And especially now that we're finally seeing that the authenticity of the storyteller is really important. So in my development, which I'm doing now, because I sold my first pilot first time out, but that happened last year to NBC. I'm very, very careful now because I've been so privileged to be in a field where I was a storyteller, but it wasn't really. I might not have been the best storyteller, but I was the lucky one that got to tell the story. I'm very careful about appropriation now. So trying to find the right storyteller. So in my development, I'm also trying to say, and I don't want to direct this, but I want to exec produce this. I want the story to be told, but maybe there's a better director than me for it. And now that the talent and the experience is out there, you know, we're not getting the arguments, well, she hasn't done or he, you know, you know. Okay, you don't think that's good enough? Even the Directors Guild of America has a contract that says 
if you feel that this person isn't ready, you can hire another experienced director to just be there as backup. You really want to put your money where your mouth is and you want to give somebody a chance, but you're nervous? Fine, be nervous. You can have Mary Lou there to back her up or him up, but you're going to give that person a shot. A contract exists for that. The Directors Guild of America negotiated. That's fantastic. Yeah, I didn't wasn't aware of that. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 Now, mind you, you know, we could also just say, you know, which I did with numerous people, hey, they can call me in the middle of the night if I have any problems. And I do get those calls. <laughs> <laughs> or they can come to my house and we'll shot list on the weekend. I'll do that. You know, it's not a problem. But having the person that they can fall back on or a person that is there to help and sort of guarantee their success because I'm really saying this person knows what the hell they're doing and are they going to fall on their face? They might. They'll make a mistake. I make mistakes. But will they learn from them? The people I'm recommending will get better with every opportunity they have. And they'll fail up Mm -hmm. like a lot of men have done for decades. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) That is true. I I mean, I want to second... Everything you just said, but particularly the shift in community, it's happening on the writer front. It's happening on the director front. It's happening, you know, I think even on the actor front, like in a way that did not happen in the 80s. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I got introduced to you through Jen McGowan, who I want to shout out for her amazing strike brunches. She was bringing together all sorts of fantastic super talented, really amazing people during the strike once a week. And it's such a welcoming and I don't know, it, it, it is such an, a different world we can be creating and are yeah. um, given the opportunity to continue having yeah. an entertainment industry, hopefully. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. And, you know, I had I had people like that uh, during the pandemic. Wendy Calhoun had a gathering for people who was like, it went, oh, yeah, this is so nice to talk to colleagues during this time when who know this was before yeah. we were back to work yeah. and our industry led the world in saying we can work under safe protocols <laughs> even though i got covid twice <laughs> but you know, did okay. you get it from set who okay. knows you, you, you never know, never know where you get it. all right so back to the Emmy nomination i want to ask what that means for you personally and in your career what does the emmy nomination mean okay so the first one was a huge surprise i mean the first primetime one as a person who's a member of the academy and sees the magazine come in and see the amount of print ads and television commercials for shows that have a lot lot a lot of money put in to their pr and sometimes there is a connection to those pieces getting nominations i'm just going to say And then to be on one that had done nothing, zero, or very little, and a show that a lot of people hadn't even heard of on a network that people go, what's BET? (laughs) You know? And I'm so proud to work in that space. That space has been very, very, very generous to me that I got to tell some of these stories. I mean, I've done many shows on BET um, and for smaller cable, you know, like UPN and the WB, you know, when they were fledgling, you know, in their first years, um, it was a place where I was asked to work. And I went, oh, yes, I'd love to. So the first one was, oh, my goodness. (laughs) Um, The second one was, I really belong here. Mm. And I'm going to tell you that feels good. It feels good because it wasn't an accident. And a few more people know about the show. And more important, it's not me. It's Jordan E. Cooper who created the show. It's Debbie Allen who directed the pilot that got it sold. It's Ms. Pat and her authenticity and uniqueness, you know, that has been recognized by people like Norman Lear. And, you know, I saw this pilot and read it and I went, this is as groundbreaking as all in the family. Mm. And me to get an opportunity to be part of this storytelling. Yes, yes, yes. And I learned something new every day on that show. And I am overwhelmed by the generosity of people who respectfully share with me 
what I don't know, but I'm, I respectfully want to learn and not that I want to be schooled. It's my responsibility to know a lot of things. Like for instance, this subject of, which is the title of the show I've been nominated for, which is don't touch my hair. I know a lot. I know a lot about hair. I know a lot about how important it is, especially to black women. I'd also been on a show where I thought, oh, F, I am not going to get this shot because of the humidity today. Or a PA who doesn't understand that I need an umbrella to walk this person who's going to walk as quickly as possible from the makeup and hair trailer to set so that the hair still looks good. So I get it. I've seen the Chris Rock documentary, which I, I, I'm sorry, I have schooled more white people to say, you need to watch this. <laughs> Call good hair. I said, you need to watch this. <laughs> Don't ask people to tell you, you need to watch this. But that's enough. But it's also, you know, the, the my first AD on the Ms. Pat show, Drew Powell, is possibly one of the kindest men I've ever, you know, and if I've misstepped, he kindly tells me and says, don't do that. <laughs> Or, you know, you did that. And I go, oh, my God, did I? And, you know, but it's with a spirit of generosity and respect so that I go out into the world more respectful. So second Emmy nomination meant a lot, even more than the first. Wow. Yeah. Definitely kudos. And I will be I will certainly be rooting for you. I'm not a member of the Academy, so I can't vote for you, unfortunately. Otherwise, I would. And now that I'm governor of the Academy, one of the governors in the directing peer group, I, uh, myself, one of the exec producers of Miss Pat and one of the actors, we did a campaign to get more people to join. And we put our money where our mouth is because we offered to pay the application fee and first year's dues if they got accepted to the academy. Um, and I want to encourage anyone. So many people go, oh, am I eligible? I go, hell yes, you are. <laughs> You're working in the industry. You are eligible to join the academy. Please join and please vote. I worked for ABC television as an executive assistant for 22 years. Wow. For better or worse. And I worked for very high level folks within the company and, and such. And, but yeah. I was not eligible to be a voting member of the Academy for whatever reason. In some ways, it seems, for lack of a better word, sexist, because by far most of the people that mm. do that job are women have been women, probably still are women. And like a lot of support positions, things don't get done without us. And yet we couldn't participate in that part of the process. And frankly, we are probably more likely than many of the other members to have watched a lot of the shows and be able to make an objective judgment about what is good and what isn't based on having seen it. I just made a note in my calendar tomorrow. I am in the unique position as a governor in the academy to say something. <laughs> so I will be calling Brandy Curry tomorrow morning and say, why don't we have a category for support positions? <laughs> and I will say that. <laughs> All right. For a long time, for, for several years, I was a non-voting member, yeah. um, which allowed me to go to various events and screenings and such, but I was not eligible to vote. The Alliance of Women Directors now has an ally mm -hmm. position where if you're a student or a person who wants to support the Alliance of Women Directors, you can join. And it's a very small fee. I think it's $50 a year. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of benefits mm -hmm. to it. Yeah. So I love that organizations are doing this. And listen, there's so many support organizations. If you look at Start With Eight or um, the Black Magic Collective. There's so many. What I want to shine a light on is the advocacy and bringing up this next generation. And that's the story I want to tell. You know, listen, I've done enough episodes. Two more episodes of this is not going to make or break my career. But providing 10 opportunities for somebody else, that's a legacy I'd be very proud of. That is amazing. So we could talk all night, all day, whatever, <laughs> whatever time it is. I don't know. Do you have any favorite actresses or what are the highlights? Um, 
Debbie Morgan. Mm. She could read the phone book and I would direct her if she allowed me. I adore her. What did you work with her on? Our Kind of People. Mm. And then I cast her on Sacrifice with Paula Patton. Okay. And I went, Debbie Morgan, oh yeah. <laughs> and it's a very different role. Um, Tracy Ellis Ross. Um, Jennifer Lewis. I mean, oh my, I mean, I got, I get chills. Uh, Michael Beach. Oh, I love him. Yeah. Well, I love him too. <laughs> um, and young ones, you know, Soraya, who I work with on Kingdom Business is astounding, as is Chandra, mm. who yeah. plays her love interest on the show. Um, Paula Patton, you know, talk about beautiful and bright. I mean, smart as a whip exec producer. Yeah. Um, Scott Bakula. We love Scott Bakula <laughs> over here. One of the nicest men on the planet. Uh, Ana Ortiz that I worked with on Devious Maids. I mean, that whole, that whole cast of Devious Maids was amazing. There's, there's, there's so many. I mean, I, I mean, I love all my actors so much as I feel like, oh my God, I forgot like 10 of them I should mention right now. But um, there's ones that just touch heart. Keisha Sharp. Mm-hmm. You know, I knew from girlfriends. I went, oh, wow. And also, I'm really good at seeing the actors who have directing potential. Mm. And it's, it, it's the way they approach their work. It's they tend to me be macro thinkers as opposed to micro thinkers and, and, and micro thinking being very good for a character. And it's also probably why I would be really terrible as an actress now. Because I can't turn off that watching gene. Listen, I consume a lot of television because I think it's my job too. But also because it's like the best part of my job. And and you never sleep. So we've established (laughs) that. Well, you know. I just want to talk real quick about NCIS New Orleans, Scott Bakula, CCH Pounder. CCH. I And I knew she had the show. We ran into each other at Trader Joe's. First of all, you know CCH also has one of the foremost art collections. I mean, people ask oh. to borrow stuff for museum shows. Wow. Uh, and she used to run a gallery. She had one here in L.A. And then she and her late husband also, I think, had a, a small museum in Senegal. And I'm going to tell a great CCH. CCH knew that my daughter wanted to enter the art world, where my daughter is now a director of a very prestigious gallery in New York. But when Maggie was applying, you know, she always, you know, did she get into Sarah Lawrence? I mean, she was, I think she, I, she might have even offered to write, a, you know, a letter of recommendation. But CCH and I run into um, each other at Trader Joe's in Hollywood. And she goes, I just got cast in a show with Scott Bakula. And I go, oh my God, and this is before I even got invited to direct the show. It was great. I love her as a person. I love her as an actress. I love her as a curator of art. Oh, and and I will tell you, my only thing that pissed me off sometimes, because I've watched every episode of NCIS New Orleans, was if there was a scene that CCH didn't sing in, I would go, who directed this? I wanted to kill him. I wanted to kill him because CCH was and always is possible of creating gold acting gold and if you left when it was only silver you're a bad director <laughs> all right wait for the, the gold bar has it'll been come raised. With her. it'll come every time oh that's awesome that is awesome yeah. well melissa worked with scott bacula and it's he has some wonderful scenes scott does with his now present wife chelsea field who played especially in that last season and recurred in the seasons before that you know they're great together but CCH and Scott, from the beginning, it was, oh, this is special. This, um, you know, it was just, you couldn't touch it. They were just, I, I, I still have one on my reel, which was from the first episode I directed. And I'll tell this fairly quickly. It was the Katrina episode. So it's the Genesis story of how a lot of these characters knew each other flash forward present day of when the series is taking place. There's a moment in a, I don't know if you called it a mortuary tent. It was a tent attended by physicians like CCH's character. 
that was just full of dead bodies. And Scott's character meets CCH's character for the first time since Katrina has happened. And it's a silent moment between them. Mm. I mean, I get I get goosebumps even thinking about how good their work was. And they hug each other. And it's you just go, well, who's going to think I'm a bad director watching that? <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> and then they did it again and again and again. I remember, you know, one of the last episodes, scenes I directed with the two of them. And you just go, oh, yeah, they are magic together. That is fantastic. That is amazing. It's been so delightful to talk with you. I wish we could keep talking, but apparently we can only run these podcasts so long. <laughs> well, thank you both so much. And uh, who's listening? Melissa. Melissa. Back. Melissa. Melissa. I'm sorry. That's okay. But thank you all so much. It's thank been you. A, it's been a pleasure. And best of luck. My fingers are crossed and everything else for you. Thank you. And listen, you know, my feeling is I'm a winner already. I'm in I'm in a category with some unbelievably talented people mm -hmm. and any recognition I can bring to Jordan e. Cooper and Miss Pat and the people who were wise enough to take a chance on this show and say, yeah, people need to see the authenticity of this story. I'm proud to shine a light on it in any small way I can. Excellent. All, All right. right. Well, we'll be cheering. We'll be cheering. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Now I have to find a dress. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. We thank really you. can't thank you enough. We really appreciate it. Thank you both. Thank, so thank you. Much. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 For our audiography today, you can find all things Mary Lou Belli at her website, M A R Y. L O U B E L L I dot com. She is also on Instagram, Instagram dot com slash Mary Lou Belli. We also have a special holiday episode where Sharon and myself and Melissa and Sarita Fontanesi from our 90s TV babies do a watch through of the Lifetime movie, Ladies of the 80s, A Diva's Christmas. It's only available on our Patreon. So if you'd like to see it and enjoy the movie with us, please go to patreon.com slash 80s TV ladies and become a Patreon member. That's going to be super fun. Yeah, it'll be a blast. As always, we hope 80s TV ladies brings you joy and laughter and lots of fabulous new and old shows to watch, all of which will lead us forward toward being amazing ladies of the 21st century. Just like Mary Lou and CCH Pounder. We should only be so lucky. God bless us. See you next time.